Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we'll be analyzing some proposed legislation that could potentially destroy YouTube. Oh my god! The only story we're going to be covering today is that proposed bill which could have far-reaching implications for online content creation. And unfortunately, because it is a bill, there will be a lot of reading, so I am apologizing ahead of time. And I will also say, I will preface this story by saying, it's possible this bill won't get passed, and even if it does get passed, there's a possibility that nothing bad will happen. But when it comes to government regulation, I have very little faith that they have given proper consideration to the implications of that legislation being passed. So I may seem a bit negative in this story, but that's me being a bit reluctant to trust politicians. It all starts with two senators, Ed Markey and Richard Blumenthal, who are the authors of this bill. And the bill is titled the Kids Act, which stands for Kids Internet Design and Safety Act. And the first portion of this bill is their findings. I'm not sure what kind of research they did to come up with these findings, but that's the first section. And I may or may not be paraphrasing the first portion of this I am paraphrasing it, so if you want to read the actual bill, I will link it in the episode notes. The first one, kids stupid, brain not developed, big dumb dumbs, poopy brain, can't think for selves. Number two, platforms designed for the goals of content creators, platforms and marketers, and not children. Three, continuously changing recommendations to increase engagement from kids. Four, gather and analyze children's data for behavioral marketing. 5. Companies manipulate consumers' decision-making. 6. Branded content in various forms of multimedia, including native advertising and influencer marketing, exposes children to marketing that is inherently manipulative or purposely disguised as entertainment or other information. All of these findings seem pretty reasonable and accurate in my opinion. For instance, Companies do exist or platforms do exist and function in their own interest because to quote myself for the millionth and one time, companies exist to make money. That is their job. That's what they are doing. Hence, they are functioning in their own interest. Additionally, platforms do adjust their recommendations to increase engagement, not only from kids, but from all users, because the more somebody uses their platform, the better it is for that platform. The better the recommendations for that individual user, the better experience that individual user has. This is not specifically targeted to kids, but I do agree, they do adjust their recommendations based on input from individual users, some of which might be kids. But I also have a little bit of an issue here because to me, this bill is somewhat redundant. Platforms have already begun limiting data collection on children under the age of 13 because of COPPA, which I'm fairly certain one of these senators was a co-author on. So I will go ahead and pose this question now. Should parents not be responsible for what their kids do and what their kids watch? Is that not a parent's job? I know this may be a little bit unfair, but I am fully aware that you are a big, big politician man sitting up on Capitol Hill arguing across the aisle like a petulant child, so much so that you don't have the time to monitor what your child is doing or to sit down with them and inform them of how people are trying to manipulate them online. I understand that, but that does not mean that you need to pass legislation that affects everyone in the United States because you can't do your job as a parent. I am making assumptions there. I don't know if that is the case, but to me, it seems like that's the only reason why somebody would try to pass this legislation, because they don't want to do their job as a parent. This is a parent's job. To elaborate a little bit more on that so I don't come across like I'm screaming at the sky, in my opinion, a parent's job is to prepare that child for the real world so they are able to be successful in the real world and live a better life than they did. By passing more and more legislation that creates this perfect world, this little bubble where nothing bad can happen so your child and just children in general don't have to think critically, you're not helping them. You're not preparing them for the real world. You are crippling them. You are giving them a handicap. That way, when they go and get a real job, they'll walk in with a big smile on their face, assuming that no one would ever be exploitative 
and they are going to get the best deal ever. They're going to get the best job and everybody is going to handhold them and pat them on the back just for doing their damn job. But let me go ahead and burst that bubble for you for a second, because that is not how the real world works. It is a dark, scary, cold place, and these people who do not have the skills to troubleshoot and critically think and critically analyze situation are going to be exploited and taken advantage of. And because they do not have those skills, they'll rely on additional legislation to protect them in the future instead of having the ability to stand up for themselves and fight for what they want. All of this kind of reminds me of a classic saying, sometimes you have to learn the hard way. What is the hard way? It is definitely not protecting everybody, putting them in this little bubble where nothing bad can happen. That's the easy way. And then when something bad happens, they're not prepared for it and they don't know how to function in that situation. Sometimes you do have to learn the hard way. Sometimes you do have to put your hand on the stove and say, oh shit, that was really hot. I don't want to do that again. No matter how many times your parents say, stay away from the effing stove, little kid, you're going to burn your hand, you'll touch it, and you'll realize why (laughs) they say, keep your hand off the effing stove. I can't believe that that was just the findings. Here's where it gets crazy. The regulations being proposed, and I will read these verbatim. This is not paraphrasing. This is exactly what is in the bill. It is unlawful for an operator of a platform directed to children to incorporate any of the following features. Any autoplay setting that, without input from covered user, commences additional video content directly following the video content initially selected by the user. 2. Push alerts that urge a covered user to spend more time engaged with a platform when they are not actively using it. 3. Displaying the quantity of positive engagement or feedback that a covered user has received from other users. 4. Any design feature or setting that unfairly encourages a covered user, due to their age or inexperience, to make purchases, submit content, or spend more time engaging with the platform. And 5. Any feature that provides a covered user with badges or other visual award symbols based on elevated levels of engagement with the platform. Okay, here is my horrifying takeaway and my understanding of what could potentially happen if this bill were to pass. YouTube can no longer have autoplay because that would be advocating a user to watch more content that they did not select on watching. Secondly, no more subscription notifications because that is advocating people who are not currently watching to use the platform and watch videos. Three, no more likes or dislikes on videos or posts because an uploader on YouTube could be under 16 and that is against the law. These under 16-year-old kids can't know what people like or dislike about their videos or which of their videos people like or dislike. And lastly, no more membership or subscription badges on YouTube or Twitch or anywhere because apparently that incentivizes children to pay money that they don't have to become members of certain products or channels or something. That's my takeaway. Pretty horrifying if that is the case. Now let's read a little bit more of this bill and we'll look at the prohibition on advertising methods. It shall be unlawful for an operator of a platform directed to children to direct content that includes host selling to covered users, expose covered users to program length advertisements, direct branded content or native advertising to covered users, direct online advertising or material with considerable commercial content involving alcohol, nicotine, or tobacco to covered users, expose covered users to online advertising or material with considerable commercial content with any embedded interactive elements that take advantage of covered users' inexperience or credulity in non-commercial child-directed content or direct content that includes product placement to covered users. Now, before I break all of that down, I want to include one more piece from this bill, and it is about grants. The Secretary of Commerce shall provide grants to eligible persons to foster the creation and promotion of advertisement-free and educational content for covered users, such as videos and applications. The amount appropriated for these grants would be 2021, $4 million, 2022, $8 million, 2023, $10 million, and 2024, $12 million. Okay, thoughts. 
I absolutely love the idea of the government going out and finding YouTubers and essentially hiring them to push government-approved messages to children. This doesn't sound terrible at all. I love this idea. It doesn't sound like the breeding ground for propaganda in the slightest. What a beautiful, wonderful, amazing idea. But in all seriousness, I think that this senator is very confused. This bill proposes that you ban product placement. Have these clowns never ever watched television or a movie? Even television and movies that are directed at kids? There is ad placement everywhere. So unless they are going to ban product placement in every single media format, including television, movies, online streaming, everywhere, then this seems like a very uneven enforcement of this regulation. Additionally, they want to ban host selling to covered users. Do you know what that means? That means that YouTubers and podcasters and Twitch streamers can no longer read advertisements in their videos because that is the host selling to potentially users who are under the age of 16. We have seen a huge uptick in this type of advertising because relying solely on the host like YouTube or Twitch or any other platform to place ads for you is very, very sketchy because at any moment they can say, well, we don't like you anymore or the advertisers think you're too edgy. We're going to pull all your advertisements and now you don't have any money and you're out of job. That's why we've seen creators start to approach advertising this way. They want control over their advertising dollars. They don't want some arbitrary rule to change where now they can't earn money. By selling ads themselves, they have control over their income stream and they aren't reliant on some arbitrary ruling or some outrage culture that changes everything on a platform as a whole. But if this bill passes and I am reading into it correctly, you can't do that anymore. You are solely in the hands of YouTube and Twitch and whoever's angry at YouTube and Twitch and wants to deplatform you and take away your advertising dollars. Thirdly, they want to ban branded content or native advertising to covered users. Their definition does not include paid. It says... Commercial content created for and distributed on a platform in such a way that the line between entertainment and advertising becomes unclear in order to generate a positive view of a brand. The thing that concerns me about that portion of the bill is I don't get paid by companies to make videos. However, I do earn money off of videos, which would inherently make them commercial. Also, when I'm reviewing a product, if I believe it to be good, I will say that and that in turn creates a positive view of that product and potentially of that company and I also try to make my videos entertaining. And that hits all of the points in this bill of what is banned. It is commercial content, it is distributed in a way that makes it entertaining and it generates a positive view of a brand. I am doomed if I am reading into this correctly, and I will admit, I may be reading too far into this, but the bill is insanely vague, and it could very easily be interpreted that way. And when the government is passing legislation, you can't ever just sit by and think, oh, I'm sure they mean the best by this and it won't ever be abused. Let's just give them all the power. The government has never done anything wrong. Here you go. Here's my wrists. Want to lock me up? I'm sure it's just because I'm a bad person. No, the government has made mistakes and the government will continue to make mistakes. Additionally, there are people in the government that are bad people who just want control and power. You can never just hand it over and assume that everything is going to be for the best. So when you see legislation like this that seems to be stepping over the line, you should write your senator or your representative and say, hey, this seems like a terrible idea and here is why. Don't just resort to sending an email saying, you suck, you're an idiot. Don't do that. Send in a well-thought-out email informing them of why this is a bad idea. Going a little bit further with this bill, I'm also a bit concerned about the age creep, meaning with COPPA, they were protecting kids 13 years and younger, and now this bill, this proposed bill, is to protect kids 16 years and younger. And just like COPPA, the proposal defines directed to children as targeted users under 16 by a platform as demonstrated by with respect to such platform, subject matter, visual content, 
use of animated characters or child-oriented activities for children and related incentives, music or other audio content, the age of models used, the presence of child celebrities or celebrities who appeal to covered users, the language used, advertising content used on or used to advertise such platform, or reliable empirical evidence relating to the composition of the audience of such platform and the intended audience of such platform. The thing that concerns me about that is 13-year-olds and 16-year-olds have very different interests. 16-year-olds are starting to look at college. 16-year-olds are starting to look at careers. 16-year-olds are looking to start podcasts and start YouTube channels because they think that's a career path they want to go down. So will all of that type of content now be captured under this new Kids Protection Act, or will that be okay? Will this be allowed to remain as vague as COPPA was, or will they be forced to release clarification on everything that they're talking about? What is allowed? What isn't allowed? What does this content actually mean in these legislators' eyes? Because right now, this could be anything. With 16-year-olds, they have a lot of interests that overlap with 18-year-olds, with 25-year-olds, with 30-year-olds, with 40-year-olds, because they are preparing for adulthood. So I think that is very concerning, and I am almost expecting them to roll out another bill in a year and a half or two years saying, we're going to protect everybody under 18 with this. No, we're going to protect everybody under 21. No, with 72. We need to protect 72. And are they going to put an age limit where once you get above a certain age, they're going to start protecting you because they need it too. People over the age of 80 need help too. They get scammed so much into buying shady crap. Come on, government. You're protecting children. You need to protect the elderly too. Do you not care about the elderly? Okay, I guess you don't care about the elderly. Only protect the kids. Don't care about the people who gave birth to you. Bunch of evil sons of guns. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about this. It is a horrifying proposition, in my opinion. I would love to hear from you. Are you concerned at all about this? Do you think this type of bill could pass? We did see COPPA get through, although that wasn't a bill. That was just a regulation for the FTC. Let me know in the comments or send me an email or a voice submission. You can find all that at askbandrew.com. And I will link the actual bill from the Senate in the episode notes if you want to read what is going on there. And that is actually it for the news. We only had that one story. Now we are going to jump to what you had to say. And the first comment comes from Steven, and he says, The audio quality on the Telefunken mic is one of the best, if not the best, I've heard on the podcast or podcastage channel. Smooth sounds across all frequencies. At $1,900, it's not going to be attractive to most podcasters or musicians, but if you're a professional audio engineer with a recording business, it would be a great addition to the mic locker. Steven, thank you very much for the comment. I agree with you 100%. This is not going to be a microphone for everybody because the law of diminishing returns is in full effect right now at $1,900. I think it really starts to come into effect around $500, $600, the SE4400A, the SM7B, the RE20, the Sennheiser MK4, TLM102. Once you get above that price range, you're getting marginal improvements at best, but I agree that it sounds phenomenal. Yes, it is $1,900. I think you are getting $1,900 worth of quality though. But I understand it's not going to be for everybody. And undeniably, in my opinion, it sounds great. Thank you very much, Stephen, for confirming my biased opinion because <laughs> I spent so much money, I wanted to believe it was going to be good. I appreciate you. Next comment comes from Hot ha Hussy. Hot Hussy? Did I say that right? They say, All works when they are created are automatically copyrighted. Registering that copyright with the copyright office is another matter. And yes, the content you post to Reddit is owned by you, if you created it, of course. Thank you very much, Hot Hussy. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce your name, and I'm going to stick with that. If that's the case, I am left here wondering how so many channels on YouTube are able to get away with the fact that they head over to Reddit, read posts, which according to you are copyrighted, make a crap ton of money off of it, and they don't get into any legal trouble. I understand that suing somebody for copyright infringement is insanely expensive, and the majority of people who post to Reddit won't be able to do that. 
but I imagine there would at least be one or two or three people who would have the funding and the justification and the need to go and sue somebody who is just stealing their content and uploading it to YouTube. Also in the comments, you corrected me because last week I was talking about this exact thing and I said that these people uploading to YouTube were not creating a derivative work. What I meant to say was they are not creating a transformative work. Creating a derivative work, I believe, would mean that the original author of that story would own the copyright to that derivative work as well because it's just an audio version of their story. A transformative work is what these commentary channels are, where they would read a sentence and say, here's why that is stupid. I hate everything this person chooses to be. That would be a transformative work because it is not acting as a substitute or a replacement for that original piece. I wanted to clarify that and thank you very much for both of your comments. A Priya. Next, we got a comment from Gut Punch News. He says, I'm also a curmudgeon. I need to be bitter. Maybe we could start teaching economics for four years in high school. It would be a start. They'll use that knowledge for the rest of their lives. Gut Punch News, I think that is an amazing idea because, as you say, this is information and education and knowledge that people will use for the rest of their lives because we live in such a finance-based world. I didn't have any economics classes in high school. Then when I started college, I made some bad financial decisions. And once I finally started taking economics courses, I realized the error of my ways and started taking steps to rectify those mistakes. Took me a long time to do so, but I finally did. If I had the proper economics training in high school, chances are I would not have made those same mistakes. So I think that is a great, great suggestion that there be at least one or two years of mandatory economics in high school. I think that would be a huge improvement to reducing the terrible financial state that the country and world as a whole are in. Next, we got a comment from Jeffrey. They say, as far as the Reddit debacle goes, I think it's the lack of credit that jars more than anything. You can't get signed to a publisher if you don't have a decent portfolio of work. So you put snippets online to get feedback or maybe some ego stroking. Folks take advantage and you can't afford to fight them over it. So you let it slide. I'd say the people who do the nasty are well aware of the writer's hopelessness when it comes to the legals. On another note, I do like how the Telefunken sounds. I was watching some of your old reviews after scoring a Samson C01U and a Behringer B2 Pro at a pawn shop yesterday. They both cleaned up nicely with the Samson being the pick of the litter. Do you ever cringe at any of your old reviews? Funny stuff, I must say. Jeffrey, thank you very much. I think you are exactly right that many people exploit smaller and lesser known creators knowing full well that they don't have the funds to take them to copyright court, so they're likely going to get away with it. It's only a matter of time before a well-known or a very rich person posts a story to Reddit, somebody steals it, and then they do have the funds to take that scumbag to court. It'll be interesting to see. And as far as old reviews making me cringe, so hard. All the time. It is awful to watch older reviews. When I started them, I thought they were great, but looking back, they are not well thought out. They are not thorough. They are just, (laughs) they are so bad and they make me cringe incredibly hard. But the only reason why my videos are where they are now is because people left comments saying, hey, this sucks. This sucks. Add this. I need this information. So I slowly and surely added more tests, became more thorough in my analysis, and did all of that. So it's because people watched and criticized me in constructive ways that I got, the videos actually got better. But they make me cringe extremely hard. Next, we got a comment from Pamela. She says, Regarding Reddit, the Redditor should start their own YouTube channel and tell their stories and make the money. There are videos on YouTube that teach people how to steal other people's videos on YouTube and make new videos to make money with. How is that allowed? Fry's tried getting customers to scan their own groceries while shopping, so all they had to do was pay on their way out. Seems to be failing miserably. Retail work sucks, but people need jobs. The SM7B sounds better than the turducken through my computer speakers anyhow. My favorite current conspiracy is the scarcity on toilet paper because of CV. 
the the beer flu. And can you really get the beer flu from drinking the namesake beer? Ha 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 ha. Pamela, very interesting comment. As far as allowing certain types of information on YouTube, I think the majority of it should be allowed, even if it is informing people how to steal other people's content, because that could come in in use in some cases in a legal fashion. But I understand why you'd be concerned. I would just be concerned about saying, uh, YouTube, you need to take this stuff down because then that opens the floodgates to them taking down whatever they want. If they can say, oh, we think it's harmful. And that scares the crap out of me. Then as far as the SM7B over the, the Turducken, the Telefunken, <laughs> very different sounds to me. Very different sounds. So I would not venture a guess to say one is better than the other. They are just so vastly different. In my opinion, they're pretty uncomparable. A dynamic broadcast mic and a tube microphone based on a U47 style transformer or using the U47 transformer, it's just night and day differences. And lastly, on the note of the beer flu and CV, I went to the shop today because I was out of paper towels and I am somewhat of a conspiracy guy. I like this kind of stuff, even though it is scary. I wanted to see the damage that had been done to the store I was at. So I went ahead, I checked the toilet paper aisle because I was right at the paper towels. There was plenty of toilet paper left, plenty of paper towels. But then I went to look for thermometers, rubbing alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, and what is it? Hand sanitizer? All of it completely gone. <laughs> All of it completely gone. People have lost their damn mind. It's about to get crazy out there. Things are going to get weird. I'm telling you. People are fighting over toilet paper. That's insane. How much do you poop that you need a cart full of toilet paper unless they're buying it to sell on the black market? What are you doing? So I had a hearty chuckle over the fact that all of this stuff was gone because people panic bought stuff. I was chuckling all the way to the checkout lanes, at which point I realized there were no cashiers. No cashiers whatsoever. The only... Checking lanes that were open were self-checkout lanes. You don't even have the option to go through a real person anymore. Just go over there. You're working because you already got this person fired. You already took their job. You were checking your stuff out last week, so now we fired this person because we don't need him anymore because you're willing to work for free. So... Yeah, I was laughing until I saw that and then I said, gosh, dang it. And then the thing that really bothers me about that is they film you. I hate being filmed, he says, while filming himself. <laughs> I'm fully aware. Don't act like you've never seen a hypocrite before. Don't act like you've never seen a hypocrite before. I just like knowing where the footage and, and everything is being stored. I don't know what this this store is, where this store is storing that information. Where are they storing that video? It's being uploaded to some database and they're going to say, oh, look at what Andrew bought. Look what Bandrew bought. He bought a first aid kit. He didn't buy any hand sanitizer. He's not concerned about the, the beer flu. Let's go ahead and infect him. He's, he doesn't have anything to fight against it. I'm just, I might as well just put on my tinfoil hat. Thank you very much for the comment, Pamela. I appreciate you. Last comment we got is from American Liberty. And he says... Prior to the implementation of the self-checkout trend, it was clear to me that employees suck nowadays. Work ethic, what the heck is that? Our society spent so much time going into debt, pampering the exorcist floor-spinning tantrum generation. We created a perpetual child psycho-lazy employee class. Throw that on top of nosy Gabby Nancy checkers that left us waiting in line while we heard continuous register therapy sessions, self-checkout seemed to be a no-brainer option, so yes, I am happy. Now, without fail, I have the best checker every time. Me! That is more than enough payment, but unless you need it faster or to ensure quality selection, produce, and fragile products, ordering online and having it delivered seems to make it all moot. American Liberty, thank you very much for the comment, and I must say, I love what a curmudgeon you are because, come on, we're drawn to our own, but I do agree it does seem like there has been a huge decrease in work ethic in the younger generation, in my generation as well. 
But with that being said, there are always people who are grateful to have a job and work their butts off no matter what position they're in. I, I like to think that I'm one of those people as well. I work my butt off at my day job. The grocery store that I go to, the cashier, I always go and she always puts a smile on my face because she's so damn friendly and she works her butt off every single day. I love seeing her. Same thing with the local Starbucks that I go to. Every single Saturday, I go and get a cup of coffee and they are fast and friendly every single time. They have great work ethic. And Senator Blumenthal, are you listening to me? Hey, this is not an embedded ad. This is me sharing an experience I had that I think is good, not an ad placement. So although I do somewhat agree with you that there are a lot of people that seem to have a terrible work ethic, most of my interactions are good because I think a lot of people are grateful to have a job and have income. Now, of course, there will always be employees who work at stores who sit on their phone all day, and when you walk up to check out or order food or anything, they act like you are putting them out, like you are stabbing them in the back. And I have subconsciously just stopped going to those places because I think, oh, they don't want me here. I won't be here. I'll just stop coming. I won't be here anymore. And guess what? Neither will you because your job's going to disappear because you're so bad at it. That's my take on it. I think a lot of people are very grateful for the jobs they have, and I think it might be a little unfair to say that everybody in the younger generation has no work ethic. A little bit unfair, but hey, I understand why you say it. More, You can say it all you want. <laughs> I couldn't care less. Let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bander segment. I appreciate you, America Liberty. You're awesome. Alrighty, welcome to the Ask Bandrew segment. If you have any questions, you can head over to askbandrew.com and it has instructions on how to send an audio, send in video, or send in an email, and I will most likely answer it on an upcoming episode of the podcast. Go do that. First email we have comes from Osama. They say, good afternoon, I have a question. Could I connect the Samson G-Track Pro directly with the camera? Thank you. Yes, you can, Osama. It is not the best option, not going to provide the best performance, but I made a video specifically on this, and I will link it in the episode notes. Few notes here. First off, your camera will need to have an external microphone input like the Canon 90D, 70D, T6i. I think quite a few Sonys have external microphone inputs. That's how you're going to connect the Samson G-Track Pro to it. And the way you will do it is run out of the headphone jack from the Samson G-Track Pro that is connected to your computer and then run that cable into the microphone input on your camera. And I will link that video in the episode notes so you can see the entire walkthrough. I walk through a bunch of different setups that you can do. Great question. Thank you very much. Next, we have a comment or an email from Michael. He says, I have been given a radio show in Sacramento, California. I live in the Dallas area and will be using my Rodecaster Pro to record my show, then send it to the program director in Sacramento. Do you think I can record a quality audio show for radio with the Rodecaster Pro? Thank you in advance for your opinion, and thank you for what you do, Mike. Mike, thank you very much for the email. That is a very good question, and very briefly, I think you absolutely could get a quality audio recording out of the Rodecaster Pro that is broadcast over the radio. My initial thought was that you might be missing some of the processing that's required to meet broadcast standards, but then I thought, well, you're sending it to the program director, you're sending him the audio, and I'm assuming that is that it is actually being broadcast by the program director in Sacramento. So he is going to be running, he or she is going to be running that audio through whatever signal chain processing they need to do to level it to broadcasting standards to be sent over the air. So that won't be a problem. Since you are recording it, if you have time to do this, this is what I would recommend. I would leave the gate off on the Rodecaster Pro, and then I would run a gate in post because the gate in the Rodecaster Pro is very noticeable. So if you have a lot of background noise, that can negatively affect the recording where when you start talking, then you hear this, whoosh, the gain and the, the line noise really becomes apparent while you're talking. Then when you stop, drops out very unnatural. So some noise removal software, I think there's X noise. 
if you have RX-7, there's vocal denoise. There, you can do it a bunch of different ways, but that's what I would recommend. Record without the gate, then gate it or do the noise removal in post before you send it off to the program director. And I think you'll be good to go. You can get great quality out of that. Best of luck to you. Let me know how that goes. If you ever have a, a broadcast that's saved online, send it my way. I would love to hear it. That'd be cool. Good luck. Lastly, we have a voice submission from No Names, Please. No Names, Please. Take it away, No Names, Please. Bandra, I have a really broad YouTube question for you. The growth of YouTube is undeniably massive. It is just through the roof uh, and, and continue to grow every day. More and more people are discovering YouTube. It is just, I don't want to say out of control, but let's call it a wildfire. Do you foresee YouTube making a correction as the pendulum swings up to its apex and starts a backswing? Do you foresee that in the future? And what does that look like? I'm just very curious. Can't go on forever or can it? I don't know. Thank you so much. Have a great day. No names, please. No names, please. What an amazing, amazing question. Do I think there will be a peak? And what will the fall of YouTube look like? I absolutely think there will be a peak. I think it will be a very long peak, similar to television. When will it happen? I honestly don't know. I don't think it's going to be for a while now because I don't think that YouTube falls into the same category as other social media platforms like MySpace or Friendster or LiveJournal or Tumblr or any of these platforms which have a big quick spike and then a very quick decline. I think YouTube is in a completely separate category because it has become almost like a almost like a utility. It is the archive of all video information. There are news broadcasts from 25 years ago on YouTube. I don't think the world can exist without access to that information now. We have had access to it, and I don't know what we would do without it. So although I do think there will be a peak and an eventual decline, I don't think that YouTube will ever completely disappear. I think it is going to be more of a plateau, similar to television, where YouTube has finally reached maturity, the regulations are in place, nothing crazy is going on, and it remains consistent as the go-to video hosting platform to host all sorts of information that needs to be archived because YouTube doesn't seem to delete old stuff. It's just there. There are videos from 2005 that are still up that probably get no views, but it's free video hosting. So I don't think it's going to disappear unless the entire internet infrastructure disappears or unless Google goes out of business and just shuts everything down. But I don't think that's going to happen. As far as the continued growth, I think that's going to stem from the growing up, the maturity of the the younger generation. Because if you look at, I think there were a few polls that said the number one job that people want, and they were young kids, they want to be YouTubers. So I think a lot of people, that, that really indicates how ingrained YouTube is into society now, that people want that as a job. And I think that will be the next generation that comes up, starts making content on YouTube. If they don't succeed, they will continue watching YouTube because they understand the value. YouTube is the replacement for television. You're not being force-fed what to watch anymore. You have on-demand content. You can watch whatever the hell you want. And that is an amazing, amazing tool. And I am so happy that it's here for instance. You can watch me scream at you on YouTube for 30 to 45 minutes every single week. I wouldn't be able to get a television show. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing thing. And I hope it stays around forever. I think that's actually going to wrap up for today's episode. Today was the first day I did the experiment. We're on YouTube. I did not have the intro music or anything. I just went from the intro to the first story to try to get right into the content to see if that improves the distribution and view time of the podcast episode. So I will report back to you. I'm going to try that for a few weeks, see how that goes. And then the audio version will still have the regular intro. I'm not going to do anything crazy 
where I change that because podcasts, people like listening for longer periods of time. YouTube, short attention spans. Give me the content right now. That's it for today. (laughs) That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. You are an amazing, amazing human being. I hope your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are incredible. I hope you didn't get, I hope you didn't sleep in. I hope you didn't sleep in because it's daylight savings, the bane of everybody's existence. You lost an hour of sleep, but hey, we out here. We out here. We grinding away, doggy. No sleep. No rest for the wicked. Talk to you next week. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Talk to you later. Bye. You've been listening to the Bandrew Says Podcast, a Geeks Rising production. Geeks Rising is a podcast network that exists to help you become a better creator and explore your passions. To learn more, head on over to geeksrising.com.